Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Finding and Closing the Gaps in Your Lockout Tagout Program, sponsored by Brady Corporation. My name is Joe Bush. I am an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the Council or Magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it into the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you will be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today will be John Robinson, Solutions Owner, and Tom Smith, Regional Product Manager. John Robinson is responsible for the company's lockout, lockout tagout professional services. He has vast experience in helping organizations implement lockout tagout programs and is an expert at creating machine-specific lockout procedures across numerous industries. Tom Smith is responsible for the company's safety and facility identification products. He has over 20 years of experience developing effective product solutions and tools for industrial, commercial, and construction markets. Thanks to all of you for tuning into this presentation. John and Tom, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thanks, Joe. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to Finding and Closing the Gaps in Your Lockout Tagout Program. John and I are coming to you guys live from uh, what looks to be outside sunny, warm Wisconsin. We're actually um, hitting about the mid-50 degree mark here today, so I think spring may have started here, Johnny. But I uh, uh, just want to welcome everyone. If you're on the East Coast, uh, good afternoon, and if you're on the Western Hemisphere um, and the West Coast, um, good morning. The presentation is going to be about 45 minutes, so we're going to save time for plenty of Q&A afterwards. So as Joe said, please feel free to type your questions into the questionnaire, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. All right, let's dig in. So what we're going to cover in the next few minutes, um, I'll start reviewing some of the recent statistics and the kind of the, tee up the current situation um, on lockout that will highlight the most common lockout citations. John will highlight kind of the steps that you can take now to ensure a compliant workplace, as well as his experiences and some best practices and solutions to closing the common lockout gaps within the industry. I'll jump back in to touch on some product trends, namely in the lockout tagout device area and software, and then we'll close with plenty of time for Q&A. So kind of sit back, relax, hopefully you've got a cup of coffee or some favorite beverage, beverage to sip as we go through and kind of discuss our experiences and best practices regarding this critical topic. All right, let me start with the big picture, right? Let's take a look at the total number of workplace fatalities over time. In 2016, there were a total of 5,190 workplace fatalities. And as safety experts within the industry and professionals, we have to ask ourselves, are we having an impact? The chart shows the total number of workplace fatalities kind of peaked right around 2003. And then you can see that as it peaked um, in the mid-2000s, recession took hold in like late 2008, 2009, and the rate dropped, obviously due to manufacturing employment being down significantly. We lost somewhere in the neighborhood of a million to two million workers during that time. So fewer employees, fewer fatalities, right? What is notable, however, is three things. One, 2016 represented the highest number of fatalities or deaths since 2008. Two, the absolute number has risen over the past three years, from 2014 to 2016, which is something a little bit uncharacteristic. And three, that's a 7% jump from 
2015 to 2016. So it's a, a pretty big jump um, for one year. So let's take a look at that fatality rate, not just in its absolute terms, but kind of on an index basis where we'll take overall employment into account. This chart shows that indexed rate over roughly the same time period for two groups of people, right? Self-employed, which is a line at the top, versus um, the wage and salary folks at the bottom, and then all workers are combined on that, kind of that orange line. It represents the number of fatalities per 100,000 full-time workers over time. Historically, this rate has declined year over year. And if I were to show you a slide going back to, say, the 1980s, um, that average rate would be somewhere between 7.5 in the early 80s down to about 5 uh, in the latter half of the 1980s. So it has steadily declined over the last probably three decades or so. However, it is important to note that in this current decade, that rate has kind of plateaued. And since 2013, the rate has actually started to increase. So not only are more people working, the unemployment rate right now is at a 17-year low. I think it's at about 4.1% overall. The factory growth rate in our industry is at a three-year high, um, but the rate of fatal injuries has also increased. This could be an indicator of a negative trend for us um, with the number of fatal injuries going higher, and we know the makeup and the demographics of our workforce is changing and has changed over the last 20 to 30 years as well. All right, so let me drill down um, even a little bit further in our workforce. This chart breaks that 3.6 fatal injury rate down per 100,000 employees, um, that index, it breaks it down by age group. And the rate tends to be low for younger workers and high for older workers. And it, if you notice, it substantially increases after about the age of 35 and rises dramatically for those in the 55 plus and 65 and over age groups. As we age into our 40s and 50s and beyond, our cognitive function changes and it tends to decrease slightly over time. Our eyesight and hearing often become a little impaired. Our reflexes get a bit slower. Our memory may not be as sharp, yet we still feel like we're in our early 30s, right? Um, and I kind of put myself into that age group. I'm looking at John across the table who's making faces at me, and he's, he's obviously in the younger age group, probably just a little bit outside the millennial. But, you know, I certainly, our internal state of mind, in other words, may not match our actual and physical or mental states, we think we can still play basketball like we used to when we were much younger, but oftentimes our body tells us otherwise. And accidents happen in an instant, right? Um, as, safe, as savvy safety professionals, we need to take these factors into account. Things as simple as larger print on safety signs, written checklists that help supplement our memory, and universal visual indicators or pictograms that really don't care what language we speak or write with, right? Those are some easy things that, that we can do in the industry. Um, now let me drill down a bit further in that 5,190 fatality number that I had shown you on the first slide. Um, as I had mentioned, there were this number of folks, 5,190 fatalities, where the husband, wife, mom, dad, girlfriend, boyfriend, or partner did not make it home that night. And yes, when you look at this, there's a good number of occupations which are dangerous, um, where oftentimes we don't or only have minimal control over what others do, things such as traffic accidents or workplace violence. But the ones that I've kind of marked in red are the things that hopefully as safety pros we should be able to prevent. They're not all lockout tagout related. I know that for sure, right? But we do know that lockout is certainly a part of them. And we have Significant, we have made significant improvements over the last couple of decades. Things like equipment and technology continue to improve and evolve. We have things like light motion temperature sensors, light curtains, um, safety interlocks, digital automation, robotics, better, stronger, more fire-resistant PPE. But yet when you look at that fatal injury rate, it still continues to increase. So those advances are all good, don't get me wrong. Um, and certainly, if we can design safety in and prevent injuries based on intelligent design, that would be the ideal. But as you guys and I know, we have to deal not necessarily with the ideal, but really what's, what's practical, what we can do today to bring that rate down. And as I read through um, many of OSHA's fatality circumstances or the circumstances behind them, 
it's largely human error for the cause. And despite many of our technological improvements, our human brains, which are largely visual processors, have for the most part remained the same. All right, so let's look at the industries now, drill down one more level. Where are those, where are most of the fatal injuries occurring? And obviously you can see um, construction kind of leads the way. And oftentimes that's falls from heights. Also transportation is another big one, right? Traffic accidents account for another big chunk. Manufacturing is about middle of the road. And keep in mind that this is just fatalities. It's not the injuries or the OSHA recordables. Um, and we know that fatal injuries tend to be a small percentage of the total injuries. The good news is, however, that when you look at that rate for manufacturing, um, it's approximately 2.0 um, per 100,000 employees. By comparison, in about 2003, that rate was 2.5. So it has actually come down in manufacturing over time. So that's good. So from that statistic, we're certainly having a positive impact, at least within manufacturing. But there's certainly, obviously, more that we can do. All right, now I'm going to take that further down, and let's drill down by the industries that are most cited for lockout tagout violations. When we parse the OSHA data with, by this regulation, 1910-147, we see the highest number of citations and penalties are really focused on manufacturing. And it kind of stands to reason, right, that this is where a lot of dangerous equipment resides, requires a lot of frequent maintenance. Um, the other industries pale, for the most part, by comparison. Uh, manufacturing accounts for about 77% of the total lockout, tagout penalties assessed. Um, and that really means that's over four times the number of citations issued for all of the other industries combined. So when you think lockout, tagout, obviously think manufacturing in many cases. Then when I take a look at manufacturing, and if we want to drill down a little bit deeper, um, here's a list of the top penalties for last year in manufacturing. Lockout tagout obviously leads the, the hit parade there with almost $12.5 million and 4,000 citations. Um, also notice that its cousin machine guarding is really a close second with almost $10 million in penalties. And keep in mind that uh, machine guarding kind of kicks in oftentimes where lockout does not for those tasks and activities that are routine, like cleaning, clearing, or maintenance. That's part of the normal operation of that equipment. Uh, machine guarding plays a, a big role. So we still need guarding, obviously, to prevent our employees from getting into that hazard zone, whether you're working under a lockout situation, during servicing or maintenance, or even under normal production operations. All right. so. Let's look at the history of the OSHA lockout tagout citations. And this chart goes back to 2008, where you can see it has remained relatively constant um, on the top 10 list. It has been ranked as high as number four and as low as number nine. It typically averages around four, five, or six in any given year. Um, and the number of violations ranges from around 3,200 to about 3,600 per year. Keep in mind the lockout tagout standard um, as you guys know, has been in existence almost 30 years, um, since about 1990. So let's keep this data in mind when looking at our overall workforce and what's happening in our workforce. As we know, our workforce continues to change. Um, there are more women in manufacturing than there were previously, with nearly one-third of the workforce now made up of women. Also, a larger percentage of the workforce is older, uh, baby boomers in particular. One-third of that workforce is over 50 years of age, and we know that the baby boomers are staying working longer in part because of a later retirement age. You know, not only is our health care getting better overall, but um, years ago our four parents, our moms and dads, used to have a defined pension plan. Nowadays it's more likely that we have a 401k plan. And with that 401k plan brings more market volatility, so consequently with that risk, a lot of us stay into the workforce just a little bit longer to you know, ensure that we've got a safety net. Um, and also, as we've seen, the workplace fatality rate for older individuals is higher as well. The other thing that we know, um, the average electrician is about 44 years old, or I'm sorry, 47 years old. I think, Don, if you were to look at the average maintenance person that you see in industry, 
would you say that they're about that same age, mid 40s? Definitely, and it's a transfer of knowledge from them onto the younger people. It's usually the more experienced guys are the subject matter experts. Yeah, good point. So um, the people that are performing lockout are getting older. As John mentioned, there is a skills transfer from the kind of the seasoned veterans down to the the younger folks. Um, in industry, um, and that represents kind of a growing skills gap, right, as older workers and managers tend to retire, and the baby boomers are retiring at a fairly high rate, even though many of them are staying in the workforce, you still have a lot that retire, and that does represent a potential skills gap for us to have to deal with. Um, we also know that our manufacturing base is changing, it's becoming more high tech with digital technologies and controls, um, and lastly, we also know that, you know, things like opioids in our society are becoming more prevalent. We're hearing more news reports of that daily, um, and so we have to kind of be cognizant of that as well, whether we, you know, like that or not, that's just, I think, a fact of life today. So now that we've kind of got a good overview of our current state, um, we know that employment has increased over time. Uh, we've got more people working today. Our unemployment rate is down. We know the older workers are staying in the workforce longer and they're more at risk. We know our technologies have progressed. We know our machines are more automated. And we know that we've got a growing knowledge skills gap as those older folks retire. Therefore, as it relates to lockout tagout, what are the gaps and the key areas that we should focus on? Well, one of the areas where we can get a big clue is looking at the number of OSHA citations with respect to lockout tagout. Um, inside of the lockout tagout standard, what is being cited most frequently. This kind of gives us an idea of the scope and the areas we kind of should look at in our own facilities to enhance safety. The largest number of citations written, over 20% of the total, are really regarding procedures. That is a lack of either developed, documented procedures for performing lockout tagout, or the procedures are out of date, they're inaccurate, or they don't adequately reflect changes that we've made on the shop floor, whether it's due to continuous improvement where we're moving equipment around, Kaizans, um, or we've got different isolation points that those equipment pieces of equipment are now hooked up to. So a good point of reference for everyone is OSHA's inspection directive. And if you guys don't have it, it's available on OSHA, OSHA's website, OSHA.gov. It's their CPL 0100147. Um, it's basically a guidebook for what to look for on inspection. And as, as I page through it and I go through um, section by section, there's one that's called documentation and screening for their compliance officers. I think it's D1. And it says, in particular, compliance officers are instructed to, at a minimum, ask the employer for documentation, including procedures for control of hazardous energy, certification of employee training, and certification of the periodic inspections. And keep in mind, those top three things are really number one, two, and four on this top list of citations. So John's going to dig into these gaps further, but there are basically four that we see as critical. And I just kind of mentioned three of them. Not having a documented program is really the fourth. Not having procedures or insufficient procedures, lack of training, and then how do we sustain the overall lockout program? Um, and as I read some of the fatal injury reports related to lockout tagout, I realize that many are simple mistakes or steps that are just not followed. When I look at this list of four, I would personally probably rank um, having lockout procedures and training, number two and number three, is kind of the top two priorities to kind of look at first. Because by focusing on these, you're addressing the most critical safety aspects and will often lead to uncovering and shoring up deficiencies in other areas of your program, whether it's written or in um, sustaining it. I visited a company just over a month ago where the safety manager didn't have any documented procedures at all. He was a recent transplant from another company, and we know as safety professionals we often move within companies, but he had to wear multiple hats, including safety, and he was really worried that he was kind of a sitting duck for an OSHA audit. Um, and we also know that skipping a procedure, as simple as verifying the energy has been isolated, dissipated, and shut off is a common gap. In fact, one of OSHA's case studies comes from an actual situation where a millwright was assigned to service an overhead crane. The employee followed the prescribed procedure by turning off the crane's electrical disconnect switch and locking it out. 
the disconnect switch was pretty corroded um, on the inside. The Millwright didn't know it uh, at the time, but it was so corroded that it physically separated on the inside from the switch um, and the assembly inside the electrical box. So consequently, when he contacted the electrical bus bar near the bridge railings, a fatal injury resulted. He was trained in the requirements of lockout tagout. He was an authorized employee. The millwright simply failed to de-energize that equipment by using and trying to re-verify that it's de-energized by hitting the crane start button. He skipped a simple step that's easy, and it, he forgot it, and it cost him. I'm not sure if this millwright um, was working with or someone with someone or alone. However, one of the things that we can do for our employees is to kind of look outside of our own industry, look at other industries where safety is critical, um, and use the buddy system and use checklists. So things like, if you look at another industry like the airline industry, um, I know for a, an example, airline pilots follow this process all the time. There's usually two, two pilots, a captain and a co-pilot, and before the engines can be started and before pushback occurs and before the takeoff roll starts with that, with that jet, Airline pilots are trained to go through the checklist and physically call out and or touch each major control switch or surface to ensure it's in the proper position for takeoff. The co-pilot won't let them go to the next step without completing the preceding step. So if there are multiple maintenance folks working in lockout, one of the things we could simply do is use the buddy system like this, go through the procedures, create a physical checklist that must be marked or initialed when you go through that procedure list. Um, and that can be a common or an easy way to prevent the type of fatal injury that unfortunately this millwright suffered. All right, so now that I've kind of teed up the data, the statistics, the common compliance gaps that we've seen, um, I'll turn it over to our internal safety expert, John Robinson. He's been with Brady for uh, about five years. Um, he's specifically focusing on lockout, tagout, as well as confined space. Um, it has both bachelor's and, ma bachelor's and master's degrees in occupational safety and health. So I'm going to turn the mouse and control screen control over to John. So John, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. John Robinson, safety services consultant for Brady, and I've spent the last five years traveling across America implementing lockout tagout programs in various types of industry. I've been in a lot of manufacturing facilities, food and beverage, hospitals, chemical manufacturers, meat processing, oil and gas, and although the severity of the hazards change, the process to completely eliminate these hazards within your lockout takeout program always stays the same. I've instructed many authorized trainings with my audience, typically being maintenance personnel, engineers, and technicians, so I hope I've changed my training style to meet the jargon with you safety professionals. I'm glad to be able to talk with you all today in detail about lockout takeout programs and the key elements that are required for OSHA's regulations. Let's talk about the lockout tagout program, some of its key elements, the written program, and how to keep it updated. So the OSHA regulation, as Tom said, has been around since 1990. For this key element, you need to have a written program, training, lockout tagout machine-specific procedures, energy isolation devices, you need to outline all the special processes and any of your contractor requirements. All of this needs to be in a written program that is company and site-specific so that you don't have procedures just company-wide, that they're also going to exactly the site that it's going to be at. These need to align with all of your operational practices that are used at that facility and needs to be accepted, understood, or your employees need to be trained how to use them. Here's an example of our written program. Uh, this main document will be referencing OSHA's 1910-147 standard. The key elements need to include the purpose and scope of the site-specific program, roles designated by the safety department of who your authorized employees are and who are your affected employees. It needs to have all the de definitions for your key lockout tagout terms. You need all of your lockout tagout devices that are used and where they will be stored. Any special processes that your employees use for lockout tagout, or when it comes to shift change, group lockout, needs to be outlined in this document. It's a best practice to reference any lock removal notices, any associated procedures, lockout device logs, training records, inspection forms, checklists, and equipment lists as appendices to this lockout written program. You can develop this program by going to the OSHA website and referencing the OSHA regulations, or you can find plenty of examples online and just really try to make it so that it's 
specific to your facility as possible. Lockout tagout program, how to keep it updated. Some best practices for keeping this program updated will actually come naturally with the requirements that are required by OSHA. You have to do an annual review of all of your lockout takeout procedures, and this will also identify any new energy sources that you don't have identified or any new devices or device uh, locations that need to be put in. Any annual authorized affected training that you do, you'll have documentation put into your written program. Any management of change for any of your new processes or equipment is a good practice to keep your lockout takeout program updated. So if you have a way to work with your engineering department or anybody else that's going to be bringing in any new additional hazards or energy sources, a way to manage that so that a lockout tagout program procedure is already created right when it's first implemented, you can train your individuals right then to keep your program up to date. And then another way is just to keep updated with the OSHA quick facts or letters of interpretations or any of the publications that are put out there that will keep you updated with lockout tagout. So moving on to lockout tagout procedures, this is where the bulk of your time will be spent when working with the lockout tagout program. The lockout tagout procedures are your main documents that your authorized personnel will associate to lockout tagout. These documents are a critical part of the lockout tagout program and will need constant effort. So the key elements that need to be in the written program and all possible hazardous energy sources need to be identified in these lockout tagout procedures. Let's, I'll talk about my experience in creating these procedures and some of the best practices to effectively write these procedures to have them utilized by your authorized employees. Here's an example of one of our lockout tagout procedures created in a software program that we use. These lockout tagout procedures need to be developed, documented, and utilized at, for every piece of equipment that has more than two energy sources. It's a best practice to have these posted right on the equipment so that they're there for quick reference or to have them located in binders. Another best practice that many companies are looking for is to have this document so that they can access it anywhere, like in a software program that they could access by a maintenance tablet or by smartphone. So you do not need to create lockout takeout procedures for equipment that don't that meet all of these exceptions. It has to meet all eight of these, but when you're looking around your facility for equipment that's going to need a machine specific procedure, it's a good reference just to see that if it has only one energy source, like a laptop computer with a single 120 volt, you can lock it out with one point, one energy source, and it completely isolates the energy right there. That is something that is exempt from having its own machine specific procedure. Now it's important that although you don't have a machine specific procedure written for this, your employees still know that they have to follow lockout tagout. And that's actually the fourth step that Lockout is still performed for this piece of equipment, even if you don't have a machine-specific procedure written for it. Some of the key elements that need to be required in your lockout takeout procedure is that it's designed much for just, sorry about that, it's not just for one piece of equipment. It can't be for uh, the same like pieces of equipment. Even if you have equipment that's the same, they have to be machine-specific. The procedure should include the procedure name and location of the environment or of the equipment. The asset number and ID number that maintenance has in its preventative maintenance schedule can be used so the maintenance team can easily identify and locate the document when they search within their preventative maintenance program. The procedure must caution for the specific unique hazards for the equipment. The energy steps should go from the highest hazard to least hazard and include the magnitudes for each energy source. So for electric, that's including the voltage of 480 volts or 240, or for any of your pressurized uh, pneumatic air coming in, you need 100 PSI or whatever PSI you have at your facility. The total number of locks and isolation points for the equi equipment need to be located, identified, and devices recommended to bring that isolation point completely closed so that it cannot be reopened. The verification of the energy source is isolated and stored pressures are removed at gauges or by dump valves need to be included to achieve a zero energy state. These documents can be created with a Word document, Excel file, or software program, but all are most effective if pictures are used of the equipment. With this program coming out in the early 90s, a lot of these procedures that we see that need to be updated are back in the Word days where it's just 
four or five pages for a simple air compressor to be locked out. With pictures, you can take out a lot of the confusion and writing that is written in the location of these by having a picture that says a lot more than words. Yeah, and keep in mind, Johnny, also, you know, our workforce is a lot more multilingual today than maybe it was back when our parents were, were working, right? So I think the pictures kind of help tell the story without having to read the words in some cases, even though it's still critical to understand what you're doing. But I think to your point, having those pictures are, you know, that's, that's clearly a lot more impactful than just a Word document. Yep, and it's also a good best practice to have all these pictures have tags that match up to each one of the steps, whether it's just a label that you guys print out and put on there, or if you guys have metal labels or plastic labels, yeah. uh, just have a way to identify the valves away from different from each other. Yeah. That way you know you're actually going to the right isolation point. That's a great point. When you're actually creating the creating these procedures, you're going to have to work with a few different groups to make sure that these are implemented. So I've created about 10,000 of these across the United States, and when creating these... You're keeping track of that? Yeah. Wow. I'm about impressed. 50 a week, yeah. Okay. So uh, for five years, I've worked with plenty of different industries trying to get these procedures created quickly, effectively, and completely up to code. And the best way to do this is by working with the maintenance personnel, the safety department, and the safety department will help you with any job JSAs or JHAs that they've done for that piece of equipment. The maintenance personnel is where your subject matter experts are going to be, and they will be the employees that will be able to identify if a disconnect's been moved. They're the ones that have most recently worked with the piece of equipment and can give you a lot of answers on where to find a lot of these isolation points. Uh, creation can be made in a software program or whatever you choose to use, but when you're going out to actually create it and field it, you're going to need a subject matter expert with you. You're going to take a camera if you're going to be including pictures, and then fielding notes so that you have the locations of all the isolation points and all the energy sources, all of their magnitudes, and everything that's needed for the lockout tagout procedure. Once you've collected all of this data, you'll enter it into whatever program you decide to write it in. Once these have been created and written, this draft needs to be verified by the authorized employees. It needs to be reviewed by the maintenance or the safety department to see if there's any hazards that haven't been called out within the program. And then if there's anything that doesn't necessarily need lockout tagout, you can also look for creation of minor servicing procedures that would just be in place of not fully locking out a piece of equipment whenever you would have to do something that would be routine and not actually shut down all the energy sources. The lockout takeout procedures have energy sources. These energy sources should have tags that identify which isolation point has each type of energy. For each of these different type of energy sources, they all have different ways to dissipate them and different ways to isolate them. For electrical, you're going to be looking at service panels, outlets, transformers, motors, and capacitors. And almost everything that you will write a lockout tagout procedure will have electrical. It will be your most common and most hazardous. It's typically listed as your first step and needs to be uh, taken pretty seriously and follow all of your electrical code when isolating those isolation points. The next energy sources, I mean, most of these you'll come into contact with with it being mechanical, thermal, chemical, hydraulic, pneumatic. A lot of these are going to be just pressures that need to be relieved, and you'll have to find the dissipation valve for these stored pressures to be relieved. Lockout tagout procedures need to follow a shutdown lock, tag, and test sequence. For us, that's in our software program on our back page. Uh, this back page goes in depth of not only the purpose, scope, and enforcement of how these procedures are, but the actual steps that you need to follow lockout tagout. These are the same steps that are outlined in OSHA's uh, regulations. It's to follow pretty much these seven steps, and you turn it over to the front page to see where to actually put the locks. These seven steps are the same for every single piece of equipment. It'll, the only thing that's going to change is the location of the energy isolation points. So the first step, as you may know, is that you have to notify everybody that this piece of equipment is going to be getting shut down. The second is 
to prepare for all of your shutdown by grabbing this isolation procedure, by grabbing all your devices, and making sure that the piece of equipment is orderly shut down in step three. Once you've gotten to that point, step four and five are pretty much interchangeable where you can be isolating energy sources and applying locks. Uh, depending on the energy source, you may need to jog it back on having electricity to dissipate fully some of your pneumatics. So those four and five are pretty interchangeable of being able to isolate and apply the locks. After you've applied all your locks, you're going to make sure that you've released any stored energy by looking at any pressure gauges or looking for any uh, rolling pins or any kinetic things that may need to be blocked. Just make sure that everything's come to a complete stop and you're at a zero, zero energy state. And then lastly, you need to verify. Check all your gauges, try again at the control panel, test with a meter, make sure that you don't have any energy coming in. The restore to sequence is below our shutdown lock and tag and test sequence, and it's pretty much the opposite sequence that you go to shut it down. With this, you're going to check the area and the machine to make sure that you can actually start this piece of equipment back up, that the maintenance has been done. After you've verified that the machine is fully ready to be started back up, you restore the lock out, remove all your locks, and notify the employees the work's been done. Lockout takeout procedures do require a periodic inspection. It has to be done at least annually and it needs to be done by an authorized employee or somebody designated by the safety department that is capable of assessing all of the energy sources and looking for anything that may be revised for the procedure. It's meant to correct any inadequacies or deviations and audit procedures does not mean that it needs to change. It just means that someone has looked at it and that you've went over the employees that are using the procedure to make sure that they know how to use it. If there's any changes that are made, your employees need to be retrained. That brings us to training. Lockout Tagout uh, has three separate groups, authorized, affected, and other employees that all have specific trainings that they need to get. Generally, the Lockout Tagout training is covered under 29 CFR 1910-140 C7I, and it's to ensure that all your employees understand the purpose and function of your lockout takeout program. It also uh, ensures that your authorized employees have the skills to use and remove any of your energy controls you have for your lockout takeout program. Training must cover the definitions, the lockout takeout standard, when to apply lockout takeout, the different sources of energy that they'll come in contact with in their facility, and the lockout takeout devices and where they're stored. Training types are for hands-on demonstration, classroom, or web-based. Preferably, I like classroom because you can really get a discussion going. Web-based does work if you're going to be doing it uh, pretty regularly, and a hands-on demonstration needs to be done at least for all of your authorized employees. Have you seen companies do all three at all? Yep. Are they, are they integrate all three? Yeah, when we do uh, trainings, it does include all three. Okay. And would you say that's probably one of the best practices or one of the most effective ways of training? Yeah, uh, everyone really, from my experience, learns differently. You'll see some people excel at the hands-on portion, but not so much in the classroom yeah. portion. And yeah. some people really like classroom portion with quizzes. Yeah, so. for sure. New hires have to go through training before they can actually get out into the field. So any employees that are going to be out in the actual areas of the equipment that could be maintenance are considered affected employees. Affected, authorized, and your other employees all require a new hire training. So it doesn't matter what kind of category you're in, but after you get this new hire training, if you are going to be an authorized employee, you have to go through further training. Lockout tagout for the affected employees is going to cover pretty much what your new employees are going to be covered on. It's good to have your affected employees at least getting a refresher training on an annual basis. So that way they know that they're not supposed to remove or tamper with any of the locks or devices. They understand what, what the procedures are and that only authorized employees are to use them and recognizing when equipment is actually being locked out in their areas so that they can stay away from harm. All of your authorized employees are going to be your maintenance personnel, any of the people that are actually going to be knowing how to service any of this equipment if it breaks down. 
The training should cover the machine-specific training, any hazardous energy sources that are going into it, and how to recognize which ones they'll come in contact with, which, which jobs they do, the type of magnitude of the hazards, where the procedures are kept, how to use them, and then a device application demonstration. It's best to have this on an annual training, but honestly, your employees will probably get trained on this more often than on an annual basis because they'll need to be trained on all the equipment before they can actually work and service on that equipment, how to lock it out properly. Every time that you do training, it needs to be documented, and that includes any time that it's just retraining. Retraining is for when any time you, dis you discover a gap in an employee's training. Uh, an employee doesn't understand the process, he is in an incident, moves to a new department, or if modifications are made to that piece of equipment. Periodic inspections can also identify gaps in employee behaviors when you're doing your annual inspection. Uh, anytime that you notice that there's somebody who doesn't understand, just take the time to go through your refresher training, show them the correct way to follow the policy to keep them out of harm's way, and document the refresher training. Lastly, I want to talk about sustainability and how to get this lockout tagout program to sustain itself. Some of the best ways to do this is to keep the written program procedures, training, and devices all up to date and utilized in regular training. Some of the best practices that I would recommend for sustaining a lockout tagout program would first to be getting a lockout tagout software subscription or something that you can have to Make it so that you can know when your audits are due for it, whether that's making a spreadsheet or updating into a software subscription. It makes it much simpler on your whole team knowing when these need to be audited, the last time they've been revised, and knowing what equipment you actually have procedures written for. The annual review of the lockout tagout procedures is a great way to get the authorized employees and safety to meet and discuss program implementation. So an annual review of your lockout tagout procedures is just a great time to look at the overall program to look for any gaps that you might find. Uh, I like to do the annual inspection and on annual authorized and effective training around the same time. That way everybody has it fresh in their mind and they're looking for ways to either update any of the procedures or have more questions in the training. Updating all of your isolation points is a best practice to keep your lockout tagout program sustainable. For isolation points and devices, Tom will go in more in detail about some of the devices that you use, but a lot of the isolation points can be updated. Most of your ball valves can be updated with self-locking ball valves that have locks right there, or dump valves that all you need is a single lock instead of having multiple devices to bring it into an isolated state. Conducting authorized and effective training and keeping it in a matrix at, at the same time of the review of any of these isolation points is a good practice. And again, management of change. Anytime you have any new processes coming in, making sure that you're working with the engineering department, safety, and your authorized employees so that they know what new hazards are being brought into their uh, program. Contractor training, it's best to have your contractors uh, go through a training with your authorized employees, that way they both know the overall goals by both teams. Uh, your contractors should have training before they get on site to be uh, considered authorized employees, but they will be under your uh, contractor program and have to meet your training requirements and have to follow your written lockout tagout procedures. It's good to keep the training on file for all of your lockout tagout performed so that you can reference when you need retraining done for your contractors. And then lastly, it's good to keep an inventory of all your lockout tagout devices with sign-out sheets for devices so you can identify if a device has left or if you need to order more. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Tom. All right, John, that sounds good. So if you notice, if you listened to what John was saying and looked at the slides, there were a lot of slides that focused on procedures and a lot of slides that focused on training. Those are kind of two key areas that you guys should look at. Not only is documentation and sustainability very important as well, but 
Once you have the procedures in place, you're going to need a way to keep track of those procedures, which then kind of leads into your documentation of the overall program, when your audits are going to come up and when they're due and when you need to do that periodic inspection. So um, those are kind of two critical areas to focus on um, initially. All right, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on devices. I think you guys are all familiar with a lot of the lockout devices in the industry, but what I do want to talk on about just a little bit is what are some of the trends that, as a product manager, I'm seeing in overall lockout, tagout devices. And I kind of see four main trends. One is greater convenience, uh, making it easier to apply, more convenient to work with. Another is migration from kind of a less positive tagout situation to more positive locking or lockout situations. A third is really new devices to lock out energy points that couldn't be locked out previously, which is always a good, good thing in our industry. And then fourth is the integration of smart technology and software. In terms of greater convenience, I'm seeing things like this um, that make the maintenance task easier. For example, the previous lock boxes were originally designed and my dad was an old World War II vet, and I remember seeing one of these things around in our basement. It was really for carrying um, ammunition and bullets and things like that. Um, we used it just for storage, but that's what this style of box was originally designed for. It wasn't really designed for a lockout tagout, but we kind of adopted that design. And it seems to work, right? But now they're designed to accommodate numerous locks. You can put lots of locks on a, in a group lockout situation on a lockbox. And the lock boxes can be either permanently attached to a wall or detached, or they come in compact sizes um, as well. So you can not only um, leave it at the machine where the lockout is going to be performed, or you can carry it with you if it needs to be taken to other areas around the, the equipment. Um, also in terms of greater convenience, things like the common gate valve device that we're all familiar with. Um, instead of carrying five or six different sizes for all the different sizes of handles for gate valves, um, now we've got a range of fewer models that are adjustable that come in a wider range that can accommodate a wider range of handle sizes. Um, and they're also collapsible, so it makes it easier to carry, easier to store, um, easier to put on the lockout cart, et cetera. Um, and they can also be clear in some cases so that you can see if that valve is leaking. Let's say if you want to lock that valve in the on position over time, um, the clear valve kind of shows you if it's leaking any fluids or oil um, through that handle for maintenance. Um, the other thing is I, we've seen kind of a, a trend away from um, tags to more positive locking applications with padlocks, particularly in the power gen industry. And we know that that's covered by a different standard, right? It's not the 1910-147. It's, I think it's 1910-269. Um, so it's a little bit different than general industry when it comes to lockout, tagout uh, that power gen follows, but historically tags were more prevalent there. You'd find a lot of, a lot of circuit breakers um, there, and now we're tending to see some utilities moving away from just using tags to using a combination of devices and tags to provide more of a positive locking situation and really prevent that accidental startup of the energy. These here are lockout devices that actually can accommodate both a padlock and or a nylon zip tie if the utility wants the security of the device, let's say, without the need for issuing and tracking padlocks. Um, these are relatively new within the industry. And on this particular application on an on a electrical box, um, it's convenient because it allows a panel door to be closed with several circuit breakers locked out at one time with one zip tie and, and a kind of a mini tag. Um, we're also seeing more applications that can be locked out where previously this wasn't possible. In the photo above, on the left is a fuse circuit breaker lockout where the device blocks and prevents a fuse from actually being inserted and the door closed. The top middle image is of a terminal block to keep the terminals, from phys keep the terminals physically separated and locked out. The one on the right, the top right, is a pipe with a spectacle blind inserted so that when the hex bolts are removed, that flat blind can be rotated to allow or block the flow of liquid through the pipe. That lockout device covers the hex bolts and prevents the flange from being opened or to remove the blind. Um, the bottom image on the left is a plug lockout that fits computers and peripheral devices with standard IEC style plugs. The center image is of a miniature lockout that prevents certain types of rotary switches and motor starters. I think these are ABB switches. 
from being activated. Um, so it's good to see a continual stream of new devices that can lock out things that previously couldn't be locked out or could only be tagged out. And then lastly, when it comes to um, smart software, we're seeing a lot of um, software programs and devices capable of managing the lockout tagout process from a computer and or a, a smartphone, cloud-based platforms that allow the management of visual information on and around equipment and machines are becoming more prevalent. For example, software that houses all of your equipment, all of your procedures, when they were last reviewed, when they were last updated, and by whom, as well as scheduling the next periodic inspections. It can also provide a dashboard to kind of see at a glance where your lockout program is in total. And then some cell phone apps allow the creation, editing, and auditing of lockout tagout procedures um, as well as apps like Smart Lockout that guide the customer through the lockout verification process or the, the authorized employee through the lockout verification process. Customers have the ability to search procedures, download procedures, send reports using software that provides reports by site, work area, or their overall safety program. So we're seeing a lot more in that area as well. And when John talks about um, sustainability in your program, Software goes a long way to really helping you sustain that program, and it adds audit reminders and things like that. All right, so I think um, we're at about uh, eight minutes before the top of the hour. Hopefully, we've got time for some questions, so I'll turn it back to uh, Joe and see if we've got any questions out there. Excellent. Great job, gentlemen. Thanks for your insights and expertise. Before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Now let's get to some questions. What if outside contractors work on my equipment? Who's responsible? Oh, that's a good question. I can take that one, Joe. So um, typically that responsibility is shared, um, and uh, John touched on it as well. The host employer often will have greater familiarity with the energy control procedures, however, used at the host facility, but the standard requires the host and the contract employer to inform each other about their respective energy control procedures. That coordination is really necessary to ensure that both sets of employees will be protected from the hazardous energy. John, yep. anything to add? A really common example of this is uh, elevators. Whenever you have your elevators being worked on, you usually have an outside contractor that's certified by that state to work on that piece of equipment. Now that outside contractor is going to know how elevators work, but they're not going to know where to actually isolate that piece of equipment, whatever room that's in. You need to have your contractors working with your authorized employees so that they're sharing information and that your authorized employees know when your contractors are actually locking them out. Communication all the way around. Good, good question. What documentation is required for the periodic inspections? Um, I can handle that one. Employers must certify in accordance with, I think it's 1910-147, it's, I believe it's under section like C6, that the prescribed periodic inspections have been performed, so they have to certify that. And that certification must specify, one, that the machinery equipment on which the energy control procedure was used, two, the date of the inspection, three, the name of the employees included in the inspection, and then four, the name of the person who performed the inspection. So um, that's pretty much the documentation and what needs to be on that document for, for certification. I have several thousand machines and procedures. Can I group machines that are similar to make the periodic inspection easier? Yes, you can actually. That, that question came up um, actually as a, in a roundtable group that we had in last week. Um, and yes, OSHA does allow the grouping of same or similar equipment procedures to ease the burden of those periodic inspections. A best practice is to have a specific procedure for each individual machine and posted on or near the machine. So even if you have two identical machines, it's still preferred to have a procedure for both, but it helps prevent confusion and demonstrates your thoroughness for inspectors when you do have that. However, OSHA does give us the ability um, 
to minimize the workload a little bit here. OSHA specifically outlines in their compliance directive that this level of detail is optimum and therefore allows the grouping of same or similar procedures and machines to encourage and maintain this high level of safety. So OSHA does want you to continue that machine-specific procedure, but if you have machines that are same or similar with lockout points that are same or similar, um, those grouped machines can be grouped together for periodic inspection. So you only have to inspect one uh, inspection as opposed to 10 identical machines, let's say. Is that correct, John? Yeah, yeah. It's usually used for like conveyors. You have a line of 10 or 15 conveyors. All of them are going to have individual lockout points. But if you're looking at them as a group and you identify that your employees know how to work on this piece of equipment, you don't need to show that they know how to work on all hundred conveyors that you have, just a select amount of them. Yeah, and that can get really complicated when you walk into some of these facilities that have 2,000, 2,500 pieces of equipment, all that need procedures on it. Um, it becomes really onerous and burdensome to have to try to go through a per annual periodic inspection for each and every one of those. So if it's at all possible to group those pieces of equipment, um, definitely look to that to kind of ease the burden and and try to simplify it a little bit. But remember, it's got to be um, same or similar pieces of equipment and control. Good question, though. What is a good estimate for the total number of lockout devices needed for your lockout program? I'll take this one. Uh, so first, what I like to do when I'm looking for the overall lockout devices is make sure you have all of your procedures created first. So you're going to go through your whole facility, create all of your lockout tagout procedures, and then once you have your procedures created, you're going to count up the total number of lockout points, and then you're going to want to order about 10% of the total number of devices. So if you have 100 ball valves throughout your facility, you're going to want to make sure that you have 10 so that you can lock out up to 10%. You shouldn't ever really have to go over 10% of your equipment being locked out, but if you do, you keep an inventory, and if you ever realize that you've ran out, that's the time that you need to order more. Uh, I like to divide all of the lockout tagout devices into the high hazard equipment areas. So your boiler chiller generator should have a, a lockout tagout device board that they can reference from, and then your maintenance department will have one. So if you can make it so that you have enough at each station to cover the equipment in that area, you should be fine. What is the difference between lockout tagout review and audit? Which does OSHA require? Uh, I like to think that the review and the audit are pretty much the same. You are doing an annual audit of your lockout tagout procedures, which is when you're reviewing with all of your maintenance personnel that the equipment needs to be done. You need to have it documented, and they're both really required. Okay, we're going to have to go with this uh, last question. Uh, what is the regulatory requirement for lockout tagout training frequency? So lockout tagout training frequency is that they must initially get the training and that any time that they notice that there's a gap in the employee's behavior or training or knowledge or how to use the procedure, they need retraining. There is no annual required training, but it is recommended and I prefer to have it be done when you're doing your annual review of that equipment because you're going to have to be working with those employees anyways and document that the training has been done for all of your authorized employees. Now, your affected employees, it may be overkill to have them doing it on an annual basis, but if you have a safety program with safety training matrices set up for all of your employees, it's really just a few slides making sure that in lockout tagout they know what a lock is, know not to remove it, and know that the procedures are meant for the authorized employees. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll just add to that that anytime if that machine-specific procedure changes, you also need to do training um, on that new procedure then. So whenever a procedure changes, or as John mentioned earlier, when there's new hires, you, the training has to accommodate the new employees and the new hires. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speakers. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. 
I'd like to thank John Robinson and Tom Smith, everyone at Brady Corporation, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.